Steve Place and welcome to this edition of Nonprofit Spotlight. Uh, Nonprofit Spotlight is a production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at, at Community Television. And every month we highlight uh, one nonprofit in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County that's doing really great work uh, for the community. Uh, today we are especially pleased to have with us and put the spotlight on CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, and we have the Outreach and Recruitment Manager, uh, Sita Razul. Sita, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. And we're happy to have you. Uh, Sita, tell our viewers just a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got involved with, uh, with CASA. Great. Um, I grew up here in Santa Cruz County. Ah, okay. I raised my children and then remarried and, mm -hmm. and, and have another batch. So I've been involved with our schools and nonprofits uh, most of my adult life mm -hmm. and have known about CASA for about 15 years. And so when the opportunity came to, to be involved, I was really thrilled that... Mm -hmm that they invited me to join their team. Uh, I also served as an advocate for a year and a half, so I've been on oh, staff really? for four years, oh, but I was also an advocate for a little girl. So I really got to walk the walk of what I'm inviting mm -hmm. other volunteers mm -hmm. to do. So my role is to help people learn more about what a court-appointed special advocate does, mm -hmm. what our requirements are, what um, our role is in mm -hmm. the lives of children who've been abused or neglected. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had that experience. So I get to be really mm -hmm. honest about yeah. what that would look like for mm -hmm. someone. Yeah, And I'll share a story with you. Uh, as most of our viewers know, I was a lawyer in San Jose. And in my first year of law school, I was a court-appointed special advocate in the uh, dependency court in Santa Clara County. And that was a program supervised by Judge Leonard Edwards. And That's anybody right. who knows Len Edwards, we have talked about that, a uh, fierce advocate uh, for children for decades right. and still is an advocate uh, and a great voice uh, in, in support of children. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the role of an advocate, and then we can maybe talk about uh, some of the training that goes into preparing people to be an advocate. And, uh, and certainly we want to mention that 75% uh, of your funding is from contributions from the community. So we we'll want to mention that a couple of times so people give them an opportunity to not only volunteer, but maybe you know, put a few dollars into this great, great program. That's but great. How about the, the role of, of a CASA volunteer? Yeah. So CASA uh, is a nationwide organization, so it doesn't exist just in Santa Cruz County. So mm -hmm. that's, that's important for people to understand. But every county is a little bit different. So in Santa Cruz County, we uh, require that our volunteers see the child that they're working with once a week. Mm -hmm. On average, volunteers spend about two to four hours a week on their case. Mm -hmm. So this is a really specific population of children and young adults that we're working with. These are kids who've been abused, neglected, or abandoned. Mm -hmm to the point that child welfare is involved, our local uh, family children's services, mm -hmm. and the dependency court have taken jurisdiction and said that mom and dad are not safe enough right. to, to make decisions right. and parent these children right mm -hmm. now. So the state is in essence the parent. So these are kids yes, who, who haven't yeah. done anything wrong right. to get themselves into this situation. They're there through no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense to them. And most kids just want to go home yeah. because that's, that's what has been normal for them. So when a volunteer comes into the system, we ask them to, to when they get involved, to go through 35 hours of training. Mm -hmm. And we're sworn in as officers of the court. Yeah. And that's significant because when we're in the courtroom making recommendations for this child, the other people that are officers of the court are the judge and the attorneys. So when an everyday person goes through training, uh, has support from our staff, when we make a recommendation, it holds weight for these children Absolutely, and, yeah. and our judge really pays attention. Uh, but but the, the activity of an advocate is visiting with a young person once a week. Mm -hmm. The kids are newborns up to age 21, so that's always going to look different of what you would do with right. a four-year-old or a 17-year-old. Mm -hmm. And you get to know that child as a, a young person mm -hmm. that has experienced trauma, ideally would build some trust in a relationship by visiting once a week. And then the other piece is we read the file. When we select our case, we read how this child came into care, mm -hmm. what happened. So it might be some school reports, some reports from the police, right. or the social workers' reports. We also have access to talking to their teachers, their social Wonderful. workers, yeah, yeah. their attorneys, their mm -hmm. therapists, 
caregivers, extended family members. Uh, when I was with my girl, I talked to her biological parents, I talked to the caregivers that she lived with, I talked to family members in other states that mm -hmm. had an investment in her. Right. So volunteers take all of this information and this care that they have for this young person now and we make recommendations. Good. You, you were kind enough to provide us with a video that gives us kind of a flavor of, you know, the program and uh, what you're talking about. Maybe we'll see that and then we'll come back and talk a little further about uh, CASA and the role of the CASA advocate and the training. So let's take a look at that now. Each year, over 500 children in Santa Cruz County enter foster care through no fault of their own because they have been abused, neglected, or abandoned. Court-appointed special advocates are ordinary citizens doing extraordinary things. CASA volunteers advocate for the safety of children in the foster care system. They speak up when it matters most, in the courtroom, in the classroom, and the community, and in the process, a child's life is changed forever. For many children in foster care, their CASA volunteer will be the one constant adult presence in their lives. For many volunteers, CASA is a life-changing experience that brings personal fulfillment as well as making a positive contribution in our community. CASA trains and supports volunteers who work one-on-one -on -one with children who are in foster care. So they hang out with the kids and get to know them, but they also get to know everyone involved in that child's case. Their teachers, social workers, attorneys, therapists, anyone that's involved in that child's life. And with that information, they then speak for that child in court. I come in contact with, I read files about these families that are so in crisis and about the kids who have been really traumatized by their lives. And then I meet these wonderfully open-hearted advocates, volunteers who step in and mitigate it a little bit, help out, really give the kids a chance to relax a little bit and drink hot chocolate and, and make art projects and it just helps them to really have a place to forget about all that. And at the same time the advocates are playing, then they turn around and become advocates for the kids to make sure that their needs are getting met by talking with the court, talking with the social workers, talking with the school, the therapist, whatever. I'm just so impressed. So my experience in foster care has been it was challenging, but I don't think I probably wouldn't have survived and been as optimistic or as energetic without her being there because she was always there at the end of the dark light, you know, illuminating the room with, hey, you can do this, hey, you can do that, or, you know, keep trying, you know, it's okay. And Michelle will keep trying. Yeah. I think the other side is what would, what would life be like for these kids without an advocate, without a CASA? Um, I think there's a good case to be made that some of these kids' needs would be not noticed. But if there's one advocate who is really just watching over this one child, that that advocate can make sure that that one child doesn't get left behind or doesn't fall through the cracks, people listen. They listen then because there's, there's somebody who says, I know this child well, I spend time with him every week, I like this child. This child is not a number. This child is just not a case. This is somebody who's really special to me. I think it saved a lot of kids. I can't imagine how different in a negative way it would be if we didn't have CASAs. And the fact is we need more CASAs because we don't have enough and uh, we have children who are still waiting for this gift of a CASA. CASA works. Um, they do truly make the difference to that one person. That gives you that unconditional love and support that a kid needs and a youth needs to thrive and believe in themselves. The volunteers that we get to work with are some of the most incredible people I've ever met. Because the role that they're taking on and the commitment that they're making is huge. Because they're investing their heart and their time. So there's not any one cookie cutter person that comes into this role and excels at it. It's someone who cares and shows up. When you're at the part of your life where you decide to be a CASA, you, 
You get more than you give, but you give a whole lot. That cost that goes way more beyond than just visitation. That it's, it's everything that a child should experience with at least one adult, uh, have a positive role model, whether it's a male or a woman, uh, that they should, and a child should deserve that. They, they should feel that. And of course, in that video, wonderful video, by the way, you can see the depth and the breadth of the support system that you have uh, for each child. And you were saying that uh, one of the volunteers pictured there was your daughter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A proud mother moment for you, yeah. Yes, so the minimum age for volunteers is 21, and mm -hmm. then we have active volunteers into their 80s. Right. So I was 19 when I started, my daughter was 19 when I started working at CASA. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she turned 21, and we have, we have young people, a lot of students from Cabrillo and UCSC that, yeah. that come to us and volunteer until mm -hmm. they are 21 and can participate mm -hmm. in the training. So we have a great community yeah. here. And now uh, you have, uh, although the show is evergreen, we're going to show this uh, many times over the course of, uh, of a year, um, that you have four uh, trainings every year. Right. So we have trainings generally at the end of January. We have uh, in May. Usually in the summer, in August, and mm -hmm. then uh, October, November, we'll start another. So community so. members have plenty of opportunity uh, to call and, and uh, get some more information and uh, take part in one of the one of these great trainings. So kind of describe a little bit of the of how the, of the training. Somebody comes in and, and they really have a, a desire to to help a, a child who needs some support. Uh, and, and what can they expect in way of training? Right. So our steps to this is someone just calls or emails. We give them the schedule of our information meetings. So we have those all throughout the county, different times of day to, to make it available for people mm -hmm. to, to attend. It's about 45 minutes to an hour, and you're usually in a group of really nice people that want to learn how they can help. Right. And it's truly an information meeting. It's not a hard sell. Mm -hmm. We want people to feel like this is a good fit for them, and it's a commitment that they're ready to make. Right. So from there, if people are ready to take the next step, then mm -hmm. we have a pre-training interview. We're going to send you out in the world with a vulnerable child. So we want to get to Absolutely, know you. Absolutely, of course, yeah. So that is uh, an interview that happens at our office in Watsonville. And so that was some of the footage in that video was our, our office, which is a house. And oh, really? I mentioned that CASA is a nationwide organization, mm -hmm. but we are one of a very small number that actually have a house that was a gift from our community. It was purchased with donations mm -hmm. and it's paid off mm -hmm. and it's a resource for our volunteers. Right. So you come to that interview, you get to see the house, we get to know you and you get to know us, mm -hmm. and then we will send you home to think about it. We want volunteers to be really thoughtful about this. Yeah. And then we will call back if everyone feels good about moving forward, mm -hmm. then we invite you to our training. And that's generally two nights a week for five weeks, mm -hmm. and that fills the 35 hours. And part of that is a, a time to observe in court with your class. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of confidentiality around families that are involved in dependency court. Mm -hmm. So most of us don't have an experience of what that courtroom feels like or looks like or where we would even sit as right. an advocate. So mm -hmm. we have a day uh, that is our swearing in, our class of graduation and swearing in. Yeah. But the morning is a, a day to observe in court. And for a lot of people, that's when things really come together. We spend five weeks learning right. about the juvenile dependency process, child welfare in our community. We talk about domestic violence. Uh, what are the other stressors that are right. affecting our family? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, substance abuse, c mental illness, sometimes a combination of all mm -hmm. of that. And so we, we hear from different community organizations and professionals that mm -hmm. we'll be interacting with. We also have youth that come in and share their stories about mm -hmm. what it's like to actually be right. in the foster care system. Sometimes we'll have a biological parent come in wow. and tell us what that's like mm -hmm. to be a parent who's struggling with a heroin addiction, right. trying to become safe, and maybe they only have a couple of visits supervised a week, and here you are coming and taking their kid to a park or to the library, right. because we want our volunteers to understand that our families are struggling with a lot, and, and we want to understand yeah. how to keep these children safe yeah. and healthy. Yeah. 
And it's interesting you mentioned that uh, I was a volunteer suicide hotline here uh, for a number of years. And uh, it's uh, one thing to have kind of your training and you do the role play, but it's another thing to actually be in that call room and answer that first call. Similarly, when you take uh, the training that you have for CASA, when you first go into the courtroom and do that, and I'm sure that you have, as, as many, all good agencies have, is you have self-care for the, tra the, the volunteers themselves. Right. You know. So we have a, a staff of 12, mm -hmm. and the majority of that are our supervisors. So every volunteer that comes into this role has a supervisor assigned to them. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing that we ask for our volunteers is that you do what you say you're going to do right. and show up when you say you're going to show up, right. and then we'll help with everything else. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to memorize all of that court stuff right. or yeah. uh, have a real understanding of, of how to handle a child who is affected by trauma. Mm -hmm. We want you to care. Yes. And we want you to communicate with your yeah. supervisor, and we'll yeah. help with everything. You'll be so, you know, traumatized yourself by the fact <laughs> that you're going to court, and most people, you know, have a difficulty, you know, navigating, feeling comfortable in the court system itself. But when you're there to advocate for someone else, you really have to get a comfort level of your own. And I'm sure that's transmitted by the staff through their training and the support system that they have uh, with you. Now, your commitment after this training is, is one year, right? It's actually... Up to two years. Up to two years, and okay. And most yeah. cases are usually from assignment to dismissal, about 12 to 18 months okay. is our average. Right. And then after that, volunteers can choose to take another case, or some mm -hmm. will decide to take a little break right. and see how, how it works for them. Yeah. Others might still remain in contact with their CASA child after they're dismissed, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes... It just doesn't work out that way. So, yeah. so every case that we work with, every mm -hmm. situation is is really unique and different. Just like. Yeah. And I families. did see that uh, looking at your wonderful website that people should take a look at and get uh, all sorts of information about this great organization. That uh, the court appearances themselves are, are not necessarily very frequent. Right. So advocates are actually in court about twice a year. Mm -hmm. The hearings mm -hmm. are about once every six months. Mm -hmm. There are sometimes meetings or, or interim meetings, but for the most part, an advocate is writing a court report mm -hmm. and appearing in court about once every six months. Yeah. And we were talking about uh, that you have situations where you will have actually a minor dependent mother of a minor dependent child. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, additionally complicates a situation where there is uh, advocacy needed on, a, on a, um, uh, several different levels. Uh, do you ever run into the situation for your trainees uh, where they, the mother is incarcerated? And, and uh, yeah. would you have any contact uh, with her and through their advocacy? We, we work pretty well with all of our local agencies. Mm -hmm. And so our referrals are coming from juvenile dependency court. Right. Uh, but young people affected by trauma and placed in a situation that doesn't make sense and no one's listening to them yes. will yeah. sometimes behave in ways that they might get involved with the juvenile mm -hmm. delinquency system. And yeah. so we we communicate with all of our partners in that. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I can't think of a case where, where mom has been incarcerated mm -hmm as a dependent right. when when we have a, another minor child but mm -hmm. there there is some overlap and usually the advocate is just staying in communication with now that attorney or exactly. or probation yeah. so that we're trying to get this child connected to services mm -hmm. so that they can have some and as an advocate, uh, you stay in contact uh, regularly with uh, the child that you're assigned to. But how often, how frequent would that be? It depends on each situation, or do, we do, ask do, our volunteers to contact, maintain contact, or have a visit once a week. Once a week, oh, wonderful. So, okay. and that's important because if I'm seeing you once a week, if you're a two-year-old, right, there's a lot developmentally that might be happening. Of course, yeah. That a social worker mm -hmm. who has lots and lots of cases, and they're focused on trying to get mom and dad safe and healthy, right. or right. putting out fires, uh, as an advocate who's building trust in a relationship with a caregiver, mm -hmm. I'm going to have access to more information and insight yeah. that then I can share with the social worker or the attorney who's seeing the the family and the case about once every four to six months. Mm -hmm. So, so we have one case that we're working on that we're interacting with once a week on a regular basis. Right. And so it's not to say that the other uh, people that are involved in their lives are, aren't doing their jobs. They're doing tremendous jobs in our community. Of course, yeah. They just have a lot. 
it's so kind of a, one of those things where it's uh, tried to say, but it takes a village, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to, to raise a child, you right. know. And uh, when there is need to have a volunteer advocate, you know, speak for the child, or step up for the child, or support the child, that's important. You're talking about caseload. I did notice also on your website that you have uh, advocated for 2,000 children over the course of your of your history, which right. is just an amazing, astounding number. What is your caseload uh, day to day? You, you have a waiting list of, of, of children who right. need advocates? Yeah, so in our county, on, on average, we have about 350 to 400 kids in the system. If you just took a snapshot, right. uh, about 350 kids in the system at, at any given time. Mm -hmm. And right now we have 160 open cases with an adult serving a child one on one. Mm -hmm. And on average, we carry a wait list of about 20 to 30 children. Oh, is that right? So we have numbers that we can wrap our arms around. We're mm -hmm. fortunate. Right. Our, our neighboring counties have much larger wait list and much larger population and care. Yeah. So uh, we are fortunate that we do have so much support from the community mm -hmm. that, that continues, that provides that right. house, that uh, people donate gift cards so that our kids can get <coughs> clothes or volunteers can help mm -hmm. provide birthday presents. But what our limitation to serving the kids is having volunteers. Right. And you're also saying that we're fortunate here to have, you know, so many uh, judges in our uh, court system, uh, Judge Gallagher, who we saw there, Rebecca Conley, uh, Deneen Guy, you know, who are the presiding judges in these various cases who are themselves sensitive, who are themselves advocates for, mm -hmm. as you know, we talked about this earlier, that the pol one of the great policies of the state of California is uh, we, you always look at the best interest of the child. Yeah. And this is a perfect example of how that best interest can be served, you know, by a group of people who are combining to provide the kind of support uh, that you need. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful service. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, before we go further that people know how they can contact CASA and make a small donation perhaps or to volunteer to be one of these uh, terrific uh, and much needed advocates for children. So what's the, how can they do that? So our website is the easiest way. It's casaofsantacruz.org. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And our phone number is 831-761-2956. Those are the easiest ways to make contact with us. We love opportunities to speak to uh, groups or classrooms or mm -hmm. organizations. Mm -hmm. So anytime that you might have a, a lead to help us get out right. in the community, we would appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And how much contact now do you have with the national organization? You know, as uh, is, are you an affiliated organization? Are you just kind of part of the Catholic, the, the CASA national network? Right. So there's a national CASA organization, mm -hmm. and so that has a mandate of our trainings and, and the rules that we follow to, to remain a part of that. And then mm -hmm. there's a California CASA association and there's an attorney on staff there, so oh, whenever okay. we have questions okay. about right. uh, screening mm -hmm. or uh, anything that might come up, we have a resource yeah. to go there. And I know that um, uh, some things that uh, do come up uh, from time to time, one of the conditions uh, of dependency is because there has been uh, some, some abuse in, in, the, in the household. Are you mandated reporters yes. as volunteers? Okay, mm -hmm. and explain to what, what but people here who might not understand what a mandated reporter is, just to kind of give your potential volunteers uh, a, a, some idea of what their additional responsibilities would be. Right. So mandated reporters are mandated. We have to tell. Mm -hmm. If we find out or learn or the child tells us that someone's hurting them or they're going to hurt themselves or someone else. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the easiest way. Of course, yeah. And in our training, we talk with our advocates to share that with the child when they meet them. Mm -hmm. And we also talk to them about telling the child that they're a volunteer. Many mm, of these kids, especially the older youth, have been in the system and understand that the social worker is getting paid, my teacher is getting paid, my therapist is getting paid. Even these people that are my family, my foster parents right now, are getting paid. Mm -hmm. So when a person comes in as a volunteer and right. sits down and says, hi, I'm Sita, and, and I'm a CASA, mm -hmm. and I chose you. So our volunteers choose their case. Wonderful. That's, and this is that why nice the social thing. worker put a note that you like to climb trees, and I <laughs> love climbing trees. Uh -huh. Or something bad happened in your house, and something bad used to happen in my house, and I just wanted to help another kid. But we explain to them that we're volunteers, and we're there because mm -hmm. we want to be there. It changes the dynamic of, mm -hmm. of what that relationship mm -hmm. can be. Yeah. 
So um, my little girl, we were driving one day, and she said, Sita, how do you have time for me? <laughs> and, and, you know, because she understood I uh -huh. have kids and uh -huh. I work and mm -hmm. I have a, a big social life. And it was one of the best conversations that I got to tell this uh -huh. nine-year-old girl mm -hmm. how important she was to yeah. me and how much she filled my life mm -hmm. just in those couple hours that we spent once a week. Mm -hmm. So there's a big piece of this. There's an official piece where we're speaking for right. the child. But there's these other pieces that mm -hmm. we get to do that just shows mm -hmm. a young person what a safe, healthy adult looks like and acts like. And that there's someone who sees them, who cares about what's happening for them and, mm -hmm. and what their future might wow. look like. Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have more time to talk about this. It's, uh, it, it, it brings back very fond memories for me when I was able to be of service uh, in the dependency court over in uh, Santa Clara County and be uh, associated at least for a brief time with Len Edwards and people who really do such wonderful work. I did want to ask you, um, you mentioned a two-year-old and then uh, an older teens. Uh, what is the, is there some age range that uh, is more common with some of the children for whom you're advocating? So. Most of the children, well, a, a larger number of children under three come into care. Okay. So the, the children that are born um, addicted already to drugs because oh mom was using while she was pregnant, mm -hmm. or young children that um, have, are much more vulnerable. So mm -hmm. we, we have a need for volunteers that have an interest in working. Those volunteers that work with children under three are working more with a caregiver. So they're not taking it, a two-year-old to the park. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be working with the person who's with that child every day and supporting that caregiver mm -hmm. or biological parent who hopes to get their child returned to their care, mm -hmm. uh, find support and services and learn how to be a healthy, safe parent. Well, it's wonderful. Uh, Sita, this has been a terrific conversation. I really urge people, uh, if you have, uh, uh, cast about, you know, for a volunteer opportunity, something to really do in the community that you feel is going to be not only fulfilling, but something that, that really fulfills a need in our community. Mm -hmm. I would urge you to uh, get a hold of uh, the good friends, our good friends at CASA. Uh, if you can't volunteer, or you kind of, uh, maybe you're going to wait for the next training. Well, in the meantime, maybe you can make a small donation. Right. But Sita, it's been wonderful having you here. Thank you so much for the great work. And really, thank you so much for reminding me of, of, of a very pleasant uh, time time in my life when right. I had an opportunity to do that. Uh, thanks again for being here uh, for this edition of uh, Nonprofit Spotlight. Tune in again next month when we'll be highlighting another one of the great uh, nonprofits uh, in our community that's doing such wonderful work like our good friends at CASA. Sita, thank you again so much and uh, we'll see you next time on Nonprofit Spotlight. Thanks again. Thanks.